behalf of the council and the congregation here at Bethel Christian Reformed Church, let me take this opportunity to welcome any visitors that may be here with us this evening. And certainly, hopefully, all of us desire that our reason for being here this evening is to worship our God together and to experience the joy and the fellowship of being a part of the body of Christ. Our call to worship this evening comes to us from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord and call on His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in His strength. Seek His face. Always. This time I'm going to ask if you are able, will you please arise? Let us pray. Lord, as we begin our worship service, we do so in the humble acknowledgement that we are so dependent on your grace and your mercy. It is because of your grace and mercy that we are here this evening claiming not a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness that is in Jesus Christ. Our heart's desire is that each one of us may be here in order to worship you in our songs, in our gifts, our offerings, with our prayers, and with our very lives. And that you will be pleased by the sacrifice of praise that we bring into your presence, and that we may hear you speak to us through your word, through your servant, so that we may be renewed, equipped for service in your church and in your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Amen. Continue our, our worship service and our songs of thanksgiving and praise. Let us sing um, songs of thanksgiving and praise and then shine, Jesus, shine. Let us sing them right after each other.
God's covenant people, it is our confession that our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who has made both the heavens and the earth, and now receive God's greeting, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father through the faithful working of our risen and ascended Lord and through the daily working and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The love of God, the grace of our Lord, and the fellowship of the Spirit be and abide with you always. And all of God's people said, Amen. As you've been greeted by God, will you take a few moments to greet one another in the name of the Lord? Our psalm selection this evening is Psalm 27, where we read in God's Word, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe for in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, at his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It's a hymn of response. We sing, O Lord, you are my light, singing the four stanzas. <laughs>
before we open God's word, let us come before him in a moment of prayer. Lord, as we open your word, our hearts desires that you will speak to us through your word and through your servant. May the Holy Spirit help us to understand. May the Holy Spirit help us to also respond in appropriate obedience to the good news of the gospel, that we may be encouraged, if necessary, confronted, but that all of us may be built up in our faith so that as we leave here, we may be better equipped to be your sons and daughters, to become in ever-increasing measure more and more Christ-like in our daily walk of discipleship. Hear our prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. This evening's message is taken from the Gospel of John. I want to read beginning at verse 53 of chapter 7 and reading through verse 12 of chapter 8. Just two very quick introductory comments. Number one is, yes, I am fully aware of the little heading in the NIV Bible, and I don't know what version you have, but more than likely there is a heading that alerts you to the fact that in the very earliest manuscripts, these verses are not found. So you're wondering, of all the verses and all the chapters you could preach on, preacher, why do you pick on something that may not even be found in the earliest manuscripts? Well, the Lord willing, when I am finished this evening, hopefully you'll have a little bit of an answer to that question. The second thing is, is that for those of you who listen to the broadcasts of your sister church, First CRC, this sermon may sound familiar. For about a month ago, I preached it there on a Sunday evening. So in case you're wondering, yes, preachers once in a while do use what they call warmed up potatoes or something like that, a sermon that's been preached more than once. With that, John chapter 7, verse 53, where we read, Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who had heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So far in the reading of God's word, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of things we want to keep in mind as we look at these verses for this evening. First of all, we want to remind ourselves of 
The reason why John writes his gospel account, and if you were to turn to John chapter 20, the closing verses, and I'm paraphrasing now, but John writes something like this. Jesus did many other miraculous signs that are not recorded in my gospel account. But these things I've written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, sent by the Father, and that by believing in him, you might have eternal life. That's why John writes his gospel account. So that those who read this account might believe that Jesus truly is the, the, the Messiah, the Christ, the, the promised one, the eternal Son of God, the one sent by God the Father for the redemption of his people. And that those who do believe in him, there is the promise of life, eternal life. The other thing that we want to keep in mind as we look at this particular passage in these opening verses of chapter 8 is the context. And if you were to look at John chapter 7, you, you would read at least a large part of chapter 7 has to deal with Jesus going to the Feast of Tabernacles, one of three feasts that were required of Israelite men in particular to attend. They obviously were also expected to bring their families, but there were three major feast days. And the one that's recorded in John chapter 7 is the third. It's in many ways probably the one that was most eagerly anticipated and, and the one that probably was one that brought a, a real sense of joy and happiness. It was the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And, and during this time, it was a reminder the children of Israel were to live in, in, in these booths made out of palm branches or some other very uh, ready at hand uh, item of uh, a, a tree branch or uh, something that they could make a, a, a very quick shelter with. And, and for seven days, they were to live in that shelter as a reminder of their sojourn in the wilderness, as a reminder of the time that God brought them out of Egypt, brought them into the wilderness, took care of them during that wilderness experience, and then brought them into the promised land and blessed them uh, so that in this promised land, the land that uh, he... Himself, God himself said, as a land overflowing with milk and honey, that, that God would bless them abundantly. God would bless them as long as they, by his strength, by his power, would keep his covenants and obey him and keep covenant faithfulness with him. So uh, the, the, the celebration, the Feast of Tabernacles, there, there are a couple of things that that, that stand out in terms of the celebration of that Feast of Tabernacles. One of them is, the, is, is this reference that Jesus makes to the water. Now, we don't have a lot of time tonight, and so I'm not going to go into it, but that there was part of the ceremony is that in anticipation during this uh, harvest season, one of the ceremonies was to take water from the... Uh, the, 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 the pool, uh, uh, the, the spring of Gahan, and, and to bring it uh, to the temple and to pour it out uh, during six days. On the seventh day, they were to do that seven times. And it was, uh, it was a way to symbolize, uh, a way to uh, visually uh, have a way of, re, uh, of, of remembering that, that the water that was poured out water that was so necessary for the sustaining of crops and, and sustaining of life, that God would send that for the next season so there would be another growing season. But there was always a deeper spiritual meaning that, that, the, uh, that, that the water that was poured out brought not only the material blessings of another year, another crop, but it also should have also said to the children of Israel that the Lord was the one who blessed them. It was the Lord who brought 
or, or desired to, to bring into their lives the richness of the spiritual blessings uh, that he desired for the sake of his people. So there was always a deeper meaning. And that deeper meaning is tied to this water. And so when Jesus stands up, when we read in chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. He was speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that, that, that wonderful gift of spiritual enrichment. And so you have this, this beautiful imagery. But also part of this imagery that is recorded for us in several different places, but I'm going to refer to just one of those. It's in Zechariah chapter 14. In, Jack, in Zechariah 14, the, uh, the prophet is talking about that, that great day of the Lord, a day when the Lord is going to come to deliver his people, that great day when, uh, when, when that deliverance, and it anticipates not the first, but it anticipates the second coming uh, of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, on that day, I'm sorry, verse 6, on that day there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord when evening comes there will be light. Now, it's, it's part of that celebration, part of the celebration then at the Feast of the Tabernacles was that over time, the children of Israel, uh, the, the priests, the Levites, built these huge brass basins in which they poured oil. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, depending on who you're reading from in terms of some of that history, extra biblical history, either the entire week or at least for several nights, they would, they, they would burn this oil so that there would be this, it, it would be like light throughout the nighttime as a way of, of anticipating the coming day of the Messiah. It, it was, it was a, a visual representation of the prophecy of Zechariah that there would be no night. This imagery of light. Now, please hold on to that. Now we read that everyone went home. The seven days of the Feast of Tabernacle has ended, and everyone goes home. But on the eighth day, Jesus goes back to the temple in order to teach. He's there, as we read in our text, early in the morning, before dawn. And as he is teaching the people who have gathered there to listen to him, we read that uh, some of the religious leaders bring into the outer court, the court of women, they bring this woman caught in adultery. And they make her stand before Jesus, and they say to Jesus, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. Now, According to the law of Moses, this woman, women like her, who are guilty of adultery, should be stoned to death. What do you say? In all likelihood, because John tells us that this was their way of somehow testing Jesus putting him on trial, so to speak, thinking that they're going to trap him by having him say something that they can use against him. If he should say, no, no, I have come in order that I might bring a message of grace and mercy, and I do not believe that this woman should be stoned, then, of course, they could accuse him of undermining the law of Moses. And that, of course, in their minds anyway, would confirm the fact that he, he is certainly not sent as a legitimate prophet of God because a legitimate prophet of God would not undermine the law of Moses. And if he should say, on the other hand, that you're right, the law of Moses says that such a woman should be, should be stoned, 
there are a couple of things that would be problematic there. Number one is that the Roman authorities would certainly not like to hear that Jesus is advocating taking into their own hands the taking of life, which was something that supposedly only belonged to the legitimate right of the Roman authorities. So they could get him for being somewhat sedacious or undermining the rule of the Roman authorities. But it would also probably jeopardize his message because the people who were most attracted to Jesus' message were the outcasts, the ones who in the gospel accounts we read were usually described as the, as the publicans, the sinners, the, the, the outcasts of society, not the religious leaders. And if this woman was to be stoned, many of them would probably identify with her in terms of her sin, recognizing that they too have sinned grievously and if Jesus is going to stone her, well, then, then chances are that Jesus probably would also encourage some kind of other judgment against them, in all likelihood thereby losing much of the crowd that followed him. Either way, the thinking of those religious leaders is, we're going to get them one way or the other. We're either going to get him because he's undermining the law of Moses, or we're going to get him because he's undermining the Roman authorities. Either way, he's going to lose. Now, John says to us in his text that they asked this question of Jesus in order to trap him. John really doesn't have to tell us that, does he? I mean, really. Seriously. Now, maybe some of the boys and girls might not make the immediate connection, but hopefully every adult here says, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. Right? When was the last time you had only one person guilty of the very act of adultery? Can that happen? Can you be guilty of adultery all by yourself? Maybe in your mind, if you think about Jesus saying, if you lust after a woman in your mind and your heart, you've already committed adultery. But to say, as these religious leaders, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Well, where's the man? Only the woman is dragged before them. So uh, already we recognize that there's something terribly wrong with this picture. Jesus does not immediately answer. As a matter of fact, Jesus does something that we also need to be also very careful here or sensitive to, in the world in which Jesus was living, whether it be the religious leaders sitting at the city gate or whether it be the Roman government, it was generally accepted, a, a, the generally accepted practice was that any judge who was going to judge a case, either the religious case or, or a political case, would sit. It's usually the way it is today, too, isn't it? Most judges sit when they listen to a case. But what does Jesus do? He bends down. He bends down and he begins to write in the dust. Or he begins to write with his finger what appears to be in the dust. And that, of course, raises a number of questions in terms of what is it that Jesus is writing? One suggestion has been made, and I, it has some validity, comes to us from the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 17, we read, beginning at verse 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel... 
all who forsake you will be put to shame. All who forsake you. Those who turn away from you will be written in dust. Could it be that Jesus wrote Jeremiah 17, verse 13, in the dust? That's a real possibility. It's, it's interesting. I don't know how many of you have access to commentaries, but it's somewhat fascinating to me to read all of the various speculative answers to the question, what is it that Jesus wrote? If I may be so bold, let me give you something to think about an interpretation that I think I can relate to and I think has as much validity as any other interpretation. So you think about this one. When I was in the service in those early days of being in the army, trying to sleep in an army barracks, one of the things I discovered is that um, you know, you're in the barracks and you got, I don't know, I can't remember exactly how many guys were in, a, in, in, the, in, in the barracks. I know there were bunk beds and I want to say maybe 25, 30, maybe 40 guys uh, in the same room. And, and, I, and I can remember once you got through basic training and you went to your advanced individual training and then once you were stationed uh, to afterwards, Basic was a little different because you had lights out and you had to go to bed on time and all that kind of stuff. But once you get a little further along, then, the, the, you know, it wasn't so mandatory to go to, you know, to have lights out at 10 o'clock or whatever. And, I, and I, can, I, could, I can still, to this day, I can remember in the barracks having, because you have guys that are coming from all different parts of the country, I can remember guys over in this section playing cards and listening to... 1960s rock and roll. And then I can remember there were the guys who, the, the, the African Americans, and they were listening. I don't think rap was around in the 60s yet, but they were listening to soul music, okay? Then you have the guys from down south who were deep into country western music. And, and, and then you probably had some guys that uh, were a little different yet, and they were listening to, you know, maybe rhythm and blues, or they were listening to jazz, or they were listening to some. So you got this cacophony of about five or six different, and, and you know how that goes. When you want to hear your music, and the other guy's got his radio, you turn it just a little bit louder, and you turn it a little bit louder. You ever try and sleep in that? Taint easy. So one of the things that I learned to do, and unfortunately I learned really well, is how to tune it all out. So I could get to the point where I could tune it all out in order to sleep. The reason I say it wasn't probably a good habit is that eventually when I got out of the service and I got married, guess what happens? And, and, and that became particularly a problem because I'm one of these guys and there are certain times of the day, especially around 5 o'clock or 5.30, I have this thing, when the news is on, I can totally tune out my wife. I'm glad she didn't come with me tonight. I get to the point where and, and so the news is on, and I'm totally tuning her out. And so we co I come to the table, and she says, I don't think you answered me. Are we going to go tonight or not? And I look at her with this quizzical look and say, go where? I just got done telling you that there's this program tonight with the grandkids. You know, didn't you hear what I said? No, in all honesty, my dear, I did not hear a word. Jesus on his knees. And he knows that these religious leaders are not there for the sake of the purity of the church 
or church discipline. They're there in order to entrap him because they don't want him to have the kind of influence that he's having for the sake of the kingdom of God. They deny the fact that he is the son of God. They are in opposition to the kingdom of God. And so they are seeking to destroy him. They're seeking to undermine his ministry. What's worse is they're seeking to undermine and to destroy the very things of God, even though they are the religious leaders of God's people. And I believe Jesus is simply tuning them out, saying, I don't, I don't, I don't hear you. I don't want to hear you because your heart is not right. But they keep insisting. They keep badgering him until finally, and that's another little thing we want to take note of, a judge would sit listening to the case. When it came time to render a judgment, the judge ordinarily would stand and render his judgment. So when we read here that Jesus stands up, straightens himself up, and then says to these religious leaders, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He is rendering a judgment. Now one of the reasons why some people feel that that Jeremiah 17 passage speaks so clearly to this situation is that they, they, they then go on to say that, Je that Jesus, first of all, writes the text, and then he begins writing specific sins that he knows that are on the hearts of each one of those individuals. Not only writing the sin, but writing the names. Now, I don't know. We don't know, because John doesn't tell us. But it is possible that that Jesus is writing names and even sins of each and every one of them. Whether he writes them or not, I believe that the text is abundantly clear that beginning with the oldest, going down to the youngest, that each one of them, when Jesus says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, that each one of them senses in their heart that they are in, that, that they are in the presence of one who is able to see into their hearts, into their, their, their sin-darkened hearts, and is able to expose that darkness, and they recognize it. And so beginning with the oldest, down to the youngest, each one of them begins to leave. Until finally, there is only the woman left. Again, Jesus is kneeling down until finally all of his, her accusers are gone. And then he stands up once again. And he says to her, is there no one here to accuse you? No, sir. Then neither do I. When we hear those words, neither do I, hopefully all of us, will think rather instinctively of a very, very familiar passage. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we also know that Jesus goes on in John chapter 3 to write, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done 
through God. Imagine with me for just a moment. The only place these religious leaders could have taken this woman who was caught in adultery, the only place they could have taken her in the temple court would have been in the court of the women. My encouragement to you is to find a Bible atlas just so you can confirm this. Do you know on what side of the temple the court of the women is? Any guesses? It's on the east side of the temple. Now, boys and girls, I know this is not scientifically correct language because we know the sun doesn't rise, the earth turns. I get it, okay? But what direction does the sun come up? From the... Thank you, boys and girls. On the east. Do you see it? Do you see why this passage is so, so powerful? John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world... They bring this woman caught in the act of adultery. They bring her at a time when we read in the scriptures that it is before the sun comes up, early dawn. They make their accusation. Jesus says to them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And we read that every one of them, from the greatest to the least, from the elders to, to, to the youngest, they, they, they leave because they know that their hearts are darkened with sin. And in that John 3 passage, there are those who love the darkness, who cannot stand to be in the light. So, so here they are in this court of the women, and, and the sun is coming up, and these individuals whose hearts are darkened because of sin begin to walk back, so to speak, if not literally, at least figuratively, walk back into the darkness, the darkness out of which they have come, the darkness of the sin of their own heart. But Jesus says to this woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The power of the good news of the gospel, the power of the gospel to change lives, the power of God's grace to break into our sin-darkened lives in order to bring hope. So that this woman, whose life was up to this point in time probably one of real misery, clearly a, a, a life that, that, that felt the, 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 the claws of the, of the darkness of sin, is now, by the grace of God, hearing the good news that has the power to set her free. As the sun rises, as the sun comes up and and, 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 and as the sun just warms the morning and, and the glow of the morning sunrise, it is in this context that Jesus says, I am, I am the light of the world. And whoever comes to me will no longer walk in darkness, but will be able to enjoy the incredible fellowship of being in the light of being in fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Certainly, my prayer is that all of you here tonight know what it is to believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ. And certainly if there is anyone here tonight who does not yet believe, then certainly my prayer will be that you will not leave here before you stop someone 
and ask how it is that you can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ, for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, for those of us who are children of the light, may we in this new year, in 2016, in the light of the coming of the Christ child, in in anticipation of His return on the clouds of heaven, May it be our renewed commitment to go back out into this, the Father's world, with a renewed commitment to let our light shine in a sin-darkened world in order that we might bring a light and a message of hope to those who, like this, to, to those who like this woman caught in adultery, is, is living in darkness in order that they too, by the grace of God, might come to experience the incredible joy of coming into the light. May that challenge weigh on each of our hearts as we look forward to the challenge of living out in this coming new year what it means to confess that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ came into this world in order to be the light of the world. And we know that you call upon each one of us to let our light shine. Already as little children, we learn in Sunday school to sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. May each one of us no matter how old we are, take that very simple but very profound confession back out into this, our Father's world. Because we know that there are a lot of people who still walk in darkness. There are a lot of people who live with brokenness, who walk in misery. May we those of us who know the joy of what it means to experience Jesus as the light of our life. Or as Psalm 27 puts it, to know that God is my light and my salvation. For those of us who know that assurance and that joy, may, may we bring that message. May we incarnate that message. May we May we live out that message in such a way that others may truly see that light. And by the sovereign grace of God, may they come to experience the joy of going from darkness into light, God's marvelous light. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We sing as a song of response, number 481, Let Us Arise to Sing.
before we come to our God in a time of evening prayer, I've been asked to alert you as a congregation to the fact that Mike Halstein's mother fell. And uh, I'm not sure I have the sequence right, but not only did she fall, she's also apparently suffered a stroke. And I'm told that she's some 90 years old. And so certainly we want to remember uh, the Halstein family in our prayers. Let us pray. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace and mercy in the evening hour of this day. We thank you for the blessed privilege of being able to gather together as your people. We have so much to be thankful for. As we look back over 2015 and we look back at the many ways in which you have blessed each one of us, Bless each of the families. Bless this congregation. There is so much that we could give you thanks and praise for. And Lord, as we look forward to a new year, may we do so in the confidence and the assurance that our sovereign God reigns, that there is absolutely nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God, and that there is absolutely nothing that happens by accident or by chance. For we believe in the providential care of our Heavenly Father. And so as we face the challenges, the trials, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for we know that you are with us. Lord, may your blessing rest on this congregation May your blessing rest on each individual and each family. In a very particular way this evening, Lord, we pray for Mike Holstein's mother. There are times, Lord, when it is difficult to know just exactly what to pray for. But you know the, the anguish. You know the inner longings of our heart. And whether that be a heartfelt prayer for recovery and renewal, or whether that means simply to place her in the loving hands of a Heavenly Father, come what may. May the family find incredible peace and comfort in the precious knowledge that for those who are in your hands, there is absolutely nothing, not even death itself, that can separate us from your love. Lord, we pray that you will be with those within this congregation who do have particular needs, those who stand in need of your healing hand, those who stand in need of a word of comfort, those who live with brokenness in their lives. And we think not only of those within the immediate congregation, but within our extended families, within our community, fellow workers, our neighbors, people down the street. We know that we live in a community where even though we have a lot of wonderful things to be thankful for, yet we also know that there are many, many needs. And so it is that you will hopefully lay on each one of our hearts the challenge of being able to minister to those needs. So then each one of us may understand the, the responsibility and the, and the task that is ours to be ambassadors of the good news, to be agents and instruments in your hand of bringing a message of hope, a message of mercy, a message of encouragement. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership here at Bethel, to Pastor John, the elders, the deacons. We pray for wisdom and strength, encouragement. As a congregation, may these office bearers be lifted up in prayer every day. May they carry out their tasks faithfully. We pray that each one of us may give careful consideration to the gifts that you've given in order that we might employ those gifts 
for the well-being of this congregation and for the well-being of your kingdom here in this community. And we pray not only for this congregation, Lord, we pray for each and every one of the believers and the other congregations in this community. And we continue to lift up the Christian Reformed Church and pray you'll continue to bless our denomination. Bless her as she continues to seek to be faithful in reaching out with the good news of the gospel. And whether that be through mission outreach, whether it be through the radio broadcast, whether that be through World Renew, whatever the avenues are that you, you have given us as a Christian community opportunities to make a difference, not only in our own communities and in our own country, but around the world. We also pray for our nation. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership. We pray that as citizens we might diligently prepare ourselves for the opportunity that will be given us again in 2016 to cast our votes for new leadership, both on the federal and state levels. We pray not only for this country, our country, but we pray for countries around the world. And in this time where there is so much brokenness, so much heartache, so much bloodshed, so much tyranny and terror, our prayer is that the good news of the gospel might go forth in order to bring a message of hope and reconciliation, a message that speaks of shalom, of healing. We ask now, Lord, that you will be with us in the closing hours of this day. Be with us as we face the challenges and opportunities of a new week. We think especially of the children who will be returning to the classroom this week. We pray your blessing on each one of them and their teachers. Most of all, it is our prayer that each one of us may begin each day with a childlike prayer that you will use us, that you will encourage us, strengthen us, so that we may be faithful disciples following in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior seeking to become in ever-increasing measure more and more like him. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, you have an opportunity to give of your gifts, and this evening's offering is for Mission India.
So I ask that at this time that you arise, that you join with me in confessing our faith by saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our songs of praise by singing, I want to walk as a child of the light. through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will and work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs> 